Vicky's there. Hi, Vicky. In recognition of Black History Month, the Sarasota County Bar Association, through its Council for Diversity and Inclusion, is pleased to present today's interactive panel discussion. I'm Judge Karimu Hill Harvey, Chairperson of the Council. Today's presentation was made possible by the generous sponsorship of the Community Foundation of Sarasota County. For our Zoom participants, you will have a chance after later to ask questions of our panelists. Please type your questions into the chat box. We will collect and address those questions in the second half of the program. And finally, let me make a modest request. We are still seeking donations to the Richard Garland Memorial Scholarship Fund. New donations made before March 15th will be tripled through a matching grant arranged by former bar president, Chip Gala. You can donate by going to the Sarasota Bar website. Help us reach our goal, help diverse law students with their tuition and to bring them to the Sarasota area after graduation. And now let me introduce today's moderator, Glenn Pearson. Many of you will recognize Glenn from his work as a broadcast journalist in several major markets, including Boston, New York, and Fort Myers. He currently works in the financial services industry and has graciously volunteered to help us present this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Hill Harvey, and welcome everyone. Today's topic is both historical and quite timely and relevant. Mm -hmm. Some of the things we'll cover happened over 50 years ago, but it feels like it could have been just last week. In the 1960s and 70s, we saw tremendous efforts and energy toward dismantling segregation and education. The separate but equal doctrine was rejected by the United States Supreme Court in 1954. Remember that date, 1954. That's with the decision in Brown versus Board of Education. But what was to come in its place? Here in Sarasota, the answers started to come into focus with the case of Maxine Mays et al. versus Board of Public Instruction of Sarasota, Florida. Now the Mays case was first filed in 1961 and it continued for over a decade. The wheels of justice sometimes turns kind of slowly, doesn't it? During that time, several orders and decisions were issued by the United States District Court for the Middle District of Florida and Tampa, as well as the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Two of our guests today lived through those tumultuous years as students in Sarasota. Please welcome Walter Gilbert and Fred Atkins. Mr. Gilbert, is the past president of the Sarasota NAACP. Mr. Atkins is the former Sarasota mayor and city commissioner. Their experiences during their formative years obviously led them to pursue careers in public service. And we'll hear from them about those experiences. But now remember that decision in 1954. It was in 1971 that the district court in the Mays case declared that Sarasota schools were unitary and fully integrated, 1954 to 1971. The legal standards have changed quite a bit since then. And some of the data indicates that perhaps we haven't made much progress towards integrating our schools since the early 1970s. The real question is this, have we achieved <clears throat> equity in the delivery of education to all students in Sarasota? equity. Our third panelist tries to find answers to that question every day. Please welcome Amy Falk Weinberger. Ms. Weinberger is an educational consultant and the co-founder of the Lean On Me Passion Project. But we're going to get started with Mr. Gilbert and Atkins. First, Mr. Gilbert, when you go back to your youth, go back to that time, tell me about the discussions that you had with your family and your friends. Thanks for having me and, and I love this topic. Uh, we talk about this constantly on our uh, Newtown Alive tours that we do here in Sarasota, uh, trying to educate people to those times that you're speaking of. Uh, to answer your question, the discussion at my house was, are we really gonna do this? Are we gonna participate in this and how that's gonna happen? Because the process and the program that the county initiated went totally against us being a community. They took a line 
and they drew a line down the middle of our community, down the main street of our community, and divided it in half. So that was an issue in our community and our parents and our community leaders at that time was discussing what we were gonna do about that and if we was even gonna participate in that program. Well, drawing a line down the middle of your community, I, obviously you wanted equity in education. You, uh, this separate but equal thing didn't seem to really pass the smell test. Um, did you feel that that maybe this was a way to, to, to achieve that, that equality? Well, it, what they were doing, you know, they, they had to dra drag the South Sarasota County school system to this kicking and screaming. You know, they, their first steps were to, to, to comply with the court order was to put a black kid here, a black kid there, and a black kid there, and tell the federal government, look, we're integrated. So the, the federal government say, no, you're not. We're not going for that. And if you don't come up with a plan by a certain period of time, we're going to put a plan in place for you. And we who went to Booker knew that right behind our school was the entire white community. Right up the street from our school was the entire white community. If they wanted to do this fairly, there was ways to do it besides divide the community. And in our community, there's three pillars. There's family, church, and school. You take away any one of those pillars, you destroy that community. And we've seen it in other communities across the state where the, their, their people didn't stand up and fight to keep the school in their community like our leaders did. Yeah, I understand. And then schools were closed at that time. They were taking black students and taking them over to white schools but no white students to come over to a school in the black community. And the plan was to eliminate those schools altogether. Right, it wasn't until the boycott that- um, Exactly. Uh, right, we'll get into that. Mr. Atkins, uh, let, let's, yes. let's go with you with the very same question. What was your reaction and your family's reaction to this at the time? Well, <clears throat> You have to understand that this process began when I was one years old mm. and it by 71, I was out of high school by a year. So just imagine that the delay and the sandbagging and the process of uh, not wanting to fairly desegregate because I never thought integration was the, uh, the purpose of this process anyway, because if it was, it would have been fairer from the beginning. So that's, that's always been where I was. Um, when, when we started talking about desegregation, I was living in Marion County out in the woods in Mount Canaan with my grandmother. And uh, she was staunchly against it. And therefore I had trepidations about it just because I was with her for my fifth, sixth and seventh grade years. So when I came back to Sarasota in 65 and eighth grade, they were just starting to publicly talk about it because they had tried to, uh, behind closed doors, devise a plan for desegregating us without uh, our input. But after it became such a, a public issue with uh, Ms. Mays and pushing it through the federal courts to the extent that uh, it had to be dealt with, then we had a situation where we had several different uh, iterations of uh, maps to determine where would we be divided and how many would go here and how many teachers would go there. But the main part of this desegregation process was left out. It was going to be how were we going to integrate these students and teachers and staff in a way that it will be amenable to not only them, but to the greater community. That was our greatest struggle. All right. You mentioned Mrs. Mays uh, and uh, yeah. the lawsuit there. That was when the lawsuit that the NAACP brought on her behalf uh, because she yeah. would have standing. The NAACP themselves would not have standing. Uh, do you know Mrs. Mays? Have you ever talked to her personally? Oh, yes. Oh, well, anybody my age, yeah. we knew Mrs. Mays because she was, she was larger than life. She, she walked around the community bellowing out uh, truths against power and standing up for 
kids and our community ever since I had left in fourth grade. And when I came back in eighth grade, she was even a bigger trumpeter for our peace and justice. Mrs. Mays also was a former branch president here. Yes. So she was she was very instrumental in, in uh, a lot of things uh, that we had to get taken care of during that time. Well, let's go back to 1969. Talk, speaking of taking care of things at that time, when you realized, uh, uh, the community realized what was going on. And like you were saying, a line was drawn right down the middle of the community. But at that time in 1969, with students boycotting at that point in time, taking a stand, what was that like? What do you recall from that? That was a, a very trying and educating time for me as a young man. Uh, just so everybody knows, Fred and I are classmates. We, we basically grew up together. We've done some things together. We can't even say on this call, but we were there and we were part of it. Uh, and, and as I remember, and Fred will, will probably verify some of this, you know, I'm getting a little old, so my memory's not as good as Fred's. But uh, <laughs> one of our jobs at during the boycott was uh, was being bus stop monitors because, you know, everybody wasn't willing participants. <laughs> but uh, it was a trying time. We had great community leadership. Uh, the churches was used as as uh, as uh, freedom schools we called them. You know, when we first heard about boycott, our first thing was good. Hey, we don't have to go to school. Didn't work like that. Right. <laughs> Didn't work like that at all. And uh, the community really came together on this thing. That was that was what made it happen. You know, they were looking for this to fall apart after the first two or three days. But uh, you know, this thing went on a month. And it went on long enough to convince them that they would have to come up with a different plan. And it was through the leadership and the community on the whole and everybody doing their part to make it happen. That's a key point that you just said, everyone doing their part to make it happen. You know, I'm reminded of the famous quote from Margaret Mead that says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. That's exactly what happened here in Sarasota as far as that boycott is concerned. You know, and the school district at that point in time determined that they were losing about five thousand dollars a day exactly. as a result of the boycott. So, you know, when it comes to impact you financially, things can happen. Things happen at fast. Time. Yes. <laughs> well, that's. Uh, I, I want to move on uh, to uh, Ms. Weinberger. Because when we're thinking about, you know, remember there was a separate but equal thing, but then there's equality and there's equity. Was there equity and is there equity as we're coming into today? I mean, we're, you know, we're looking back at that time and even though we're, we're going back that many years, think about what it is today. Have we achieved equity? Ms. Weinberger? Well, thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you to the Sarasota County Bar Association and the Community Foundation for the honor to be here on this panel with Mr. Atkins and Mr. Gilbert and Mr. Glenn Pearson as a moderator. So to answer your question, um, there are a couple backstories, right? Um, so integration was a mess on so many levels, but to the point of racial equity of your question, that's a focus on dividing resources proportionally to achieve a fair outcome for those involved. The white teachers and the administrators of the early days of integration just didn't get the memo or they didn't read the memo or they didn't have the passion to understand the memo. And you fast forward to 2021 and for some of my white colleagues, the memo about how to teach students of color is just simply ignored and implicit and explicit biases continue to exist today in the classrooms that our kids uh, enter every day. The positive news about integration, however, is that by the time I entered elementary school, <laughs> which was in 1971, <laughs> yes. Yes. and through my high school years, I had the advantage of having black teachers. And they loved me, they supported me, and they made sure that I understood my lessons. And I was one of the only children in my peer group from a single uh, parent home at that time. And for some reason, my black teachers took me under their wings. I owe my curiosity and my grammar and my love of literature and my 
math skills to Mrs. Hoffman, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Red, Mrs. Brady, Mr. Page, and Mr. Yancey. I'm that little girl in the movie Help and the Help. And thanks to Ms. Cora and Miss Virginia and Miss Mabel, I am capable. I didn't know anything different. So I can't even begin to imagine, except what I've witnessed in the current system, the opposite of what was happening to my black peer group with their white teachers judging, withholding, and being punitive. So the history of integration in the Sarasota education system is the same story that I experienced in my hometown of Portsmouth, Virginia. It wasn't until my 30th high school reunion in 2012 that my best friend Micah, a black man, and I learned for the first time why we were never invited to any of the parties. It was because of sundowning. There was no intermixing with the blacks or the Jews after five. We had no clue until 2012. That's how much of a secret it was kept from us. So we stood in complete disbelief and because during the school day we were accepted or maybe just tolerated, the white teachers, the board of education, the administrators and the parents of white children and teens somehow got away with creating a storyline that black children are innately less capable or inferior. I don't believe for one moment that when a white child is born on the same day as a black child is born that the white child is even more capable and the black, ch black child would be less capable. There's simply no achievement gap when we are born. I think we've so, made it up. So let me interject right there because yes. you brought up a good point. Just uh, this, uh, when we're integrating and then you've got black students going uh, to school, to white schools, but they're made to feel like they can't exactly achieve as much as the white students. Within the black community, I'm going get back to Mr. Gilbert now. Within the black community, uh, let's say at, at Booker School, you never had anything like that. You were expected to achieve, were you not? We were demanded to achieve, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, you had teachers that knew that you had to do better to be better and you had to be better to accomplish because the, the world at that time was really stacked against you. We, we don't even talk about now. So, and we had teachers that were aware that the world was changing. So we had to be even more prepared. They was preparing us for a future that they hadn't lived in yet, but they knew it was coming. We just honored my sixth grade teacher, Ms. Dorothy Smith, who was the first black principal here in Sarasota County post desegregation with a bronze memorial plaque on the wall of Southside Elementary School here in Sarasota. Mrs. Smith was my sixth grade teacher who did that type of teaching. I love Mrs. Smith and had not been for her, myself and many other students wouldn't have been prepared for what was coming. So now when you look back again at that, the community here and the expectations. Oh well, look, it sounds like a Jeopardy question right now. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna get a prize. Thank you. <laughs> Give me my money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, you look at the community, the, the schools within the black community and what was, what was demanded. Then you look at this issue of desegregating and, and busing. Therein lies the problem, not only here in Sarasota, but across the country. Yeah. It so many problems, like in Boston and other places, which comes down to education being culturally proficient, teaching, culturally proficient teaching. Ms. Weinberger, can you tell me what is culturally proficient teaching? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, I hope I can. So culturally proficient teaching and learning is, the understand, um, is about understanding the current systems that are in place. So currently, if we look at our education system, it is currently in a Eurocentric and white supremacist system versus where we need to work towards, which is centric and mindful. So what does that mean? It means that under the Eurocentric system, there is an expectation of perfectionism, but under the centric model, the focus is anti-violence, very separate. Under the Euro system, there's this constant urgency, 
But under the centric system, there's discourse and dialogue. Under the Eurocentric system, there's this push for quantity over quality, but a centric system calls for trauma-informed. Binary thinking, this either or idea has been the focus of our education system. However, instead, a culturally proficient uh, teaching and learning system would be historically mindful. In other words, all people coming into the world of education from our university systems must have access to training that is centric and mindful, no longer Eurocentric and white supremacist. Understood, understood. Can, can I jump in and follow please, up on what she just do. said? That's, a, that's very important what she just said. And we are currently working with the Sarasota County School Board to encourage what she just said by doing certain things as far as training and bringing new teachers that come into this community, the, 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 the opportunity to see and learn the history of the community they're teaching in. You know, we have teachers that come into this community that work for the school board, that teach black kids that never go to Newtown, mm. never learn anything about local black history and that's a problem because how are you going to be sitting there dealing with these kids and their issues and whatever they're going through and don't even know anything about them so we're working with the school board now to initiate a program where we get to come in and help train those new teachers to that and give them the black history of newtown that goes right along with this history we're talking about with the school board to yeah. help them be better teachers not to beat them over the head with black history and you know how some people like to rebel against that thought i don't want to know anything about black history why yeah. should i know that but if you're going to teach our kids yeah you need to know about newtown you need to know about newtown's history so that's where we're coming from and that's what we want to help the school board do Thank you for that. Mr. Atkins, what are your thoughts on this? Well, in, in a real sense, it's, it's been a continual struggle about who they want to be educated. The process has always been that the more ignorant you are, the better you can get along in this system. And so this system has taken advantage of ignorant people the whole while. And so now we're in the process of trying to decide who we want to educate. One of the things that happened in our communities as kids is our teachers not only pushed all of us, but then when they identified young people that were able and more capable to do and strive to be greater than some of the others, they pushed them even harder because we knew that we needed someone to help in our community, to help direct our energy to help lead us. And so here we are in, in this process right now trying to figure out, are, are we getting educated still? That's a shame. You know, uh, it, it's, it's really, um, and what you just heard was the, uh, the school bell at Booker Middle School, I'm out here today. And so, um, and they go through that process of the, the Jeopardy jingle to help uh, encourage kids to hurry up and get to class on time. But it, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, oh, you know, man, you got man, I, thought, I thought I had won some money, yeah. man. You just bust my no, ball. I, I wanted to help you out there a little bit. But yeah, that's <laughs> that's our struggle. And, and and we 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 need to continue because right here at Booker Middle School, Booker High School, you know, the 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 magnet program, the VPA programs, it is, it is just a form of different kind of segregation. Uh, it still takes the talented and put them in a segment in a different section of the school and process them through and leaving the rest of them behind. And that's what we need to do in this process of energizing our future in this country is to bring more of us forward because the more we leave behind, the more trouble we'll have with the rest. Mm, good point. Very good point. I, I just want to come back just to look at some legalities here. Uh, Ms. Weinberger, when we talk about culturally proficient teaching and learning, is that different than the applicable legal standard of unitary school districts and equal access? 
So um, I'm not the expert on that question from that legality part because um, I'm not. But what I, I don't, I when I read that question, I wasn't even sure how to answer it. So can I defer that? And can you ask me a different question? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, you know, right. We're going to be going to questions from the audience as well. And there may be a lawyer who might be able to address yeah. Out there. Like there might be one out there. <laughs> <laughs> there might be at least one, right? Okay. I have uh, some yes. other questions. <laughs> yes, okay. All right. Well, you know, we just think about, uh, we've talked about the past. Yes. I, I, I really want to deal now. I want us all to focus on the present, what's mm -hmm. going on today with our children and the education system, because there's a lot that remains to be done. Uh, what do you think our schools could do right now to better achieve equity in the delivery of education to students in Sarasota? All right. No. Okay. You, you, you want this one. All right. I, I can do this one. Okay. All right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to say something that might be off-putting, but um, it is a mindset of my white colleagues that is a problem. And it's that, that's been a, a big problem. The curriculum is the problem uh, and we know what the problems are. And uh, so what we're doing, the Lean On Me project, which is my passion project and the Minnesota Anti-Racist Coalition, along with uh, courageous leaders who are stepping forward to participate in book circles and conversations um, from Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversations About Race, a Field Guide for Achieving Equity in Schools is where we have to start because unless we're looking in the mirror and we are not reevaluating our implicit bias that if we're a teacher and we walk in and we see a group of black children or indigenous children or Latino X children, whatever children we see, if we haven't understood our own implicit biases on how we're going to be in that classroom and what we're going to expect from one student versus another, then we will remain the problem and we will continue to have the achievement gap um, you know, expanded instead of reduced. And that's our problem right now. And we can change that. But it's got to be the courageous teachers who come forward and the courageous school board members and the courageous administrators who aren't going to be, you know, dissuaded by all the noise in the background, right? So it's passion. We have to have the passion, the will to do it. We have to have the practice. We have to go practice doing it. And we have to have persistence doing that. Without those three, we can't change anything. I don't care what the Florida Department of Education tells us to teach. All right, Mr. Atkins, do you see that happening yeah. right now? No. No? All right. Um, I, I, I don't think that uh, the curriculum has uh, changed much since I was at Sarasota High School. Uh, I think it is still Eurocentric in its flavor and it has no desire to educate the majority of the people at the campus. They just want to pick and choose who get the education and then the rest of us get left behind. And so that's, that's a critical problem in this whole process. And so no, I don't see uh, diversity in the curriculum or education our motivation and teachers to make a difference in how children learn and why they learn and encourage them to learn. Mr. Gilbert, your thoughts? I totally agree with both of my uh, cohorts there. But I'd like to say this. Uh, yes. And I know we're getting close to where we want to get to the questions and answers. Uh, yes. I look at this thing as we're in the third wave now of where civil rights has come from. The first wave was right after Reconstruction. And we know what they did with that. Mm. You know, the second wave was during the 60s with the civil rights era, Dr. King, Malcolm X, and those guys, and what came out of that. This third wave that we're in now is what we saw in the streets this past summer. And the difference in this third wave is you look at the faces of those people that was in the streets. They aren't all black people out there raising hell. Right. They're all racist. They're the kids of mixed race families. They're the little spoiled brats that went to time out, you know, 
during the late seventies and stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that now are right out there in the streets acting out. They're friends of friends that have black friends, white friends, Latino friends. And they're saying, you're not going to do that to my friend. So we're in that third wave. So we got a whole different group of people out here now that's going to have to be dealt with. That's not going to go for it. Okay. So it looks like some underlying lessons have actually been learned. Correct. Yes. Right. And so when you look at that, you look at all the protests and where we are today, do you think all of the efforts that have gone on has made us a better society? Let me tell you something. Okay, let me, let me, yeah, you take that. Go ahead. Hey, man, this is, this, this, this thing is so serious that, you know, the people that protest on the pavements of America this last year are people that are not in the leadership of this society that's basically restricting growth. Yes. Those yes. people are trying to bust through barriers. Okay. The leaders and the owners of these corporations and these political entities and institutions are still directing the force of education in America. Look, look at what Florida does. Florida is one of the most archaic education systems in the United States. Yet it's still, we still have geniuses that press through, but it's only a few. And so we've got to celebrate those people that are busting through barriers, through relationships that has nothing to do with the powers that are dictating what's going on. That's right. Okay, excellent. Great point taken. Uh, Mr. Pearson? Yes, go ahead. Your question, uh, have we be, become a better society? Uh, I, I, I really thought about that long and hard and, and, and the answer to that, it has made the black community more resilient um, it has made the white communities more entitled. Um, look, when you walk around with enemies all day long, you have to be pretty creative and pretty resilient to survive and thrive. And I think, I'd like to think that the generation below me with perhaps my generational leadership can start making that difference because there are different people showing up. And the time is now, this third wave is this moment. It is here and we have got to be present and stay present and move this forward. It is our responsibility. All right, thank you so much. It's time that we would open this panel discussion to the other people listening right now. So we, I know that a number of questions have been coming through. Um, so let, let's start with one of them. I've got some associates who are gonna help me with that. Good afternoon. I have we have a question from Mr. Mark Smith, who is the director of marketing from the Ringling Museum of Art. All right. Hello. How are you? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, lately, there has been a lot of uh, discussion uh, about diversity, equity, inclusion, access. Um, you know, not only here and you know locally, but all over the country, and you know, in my space, in the arts and culture museum space, you know, it you know, you know, it's not educate, it is education, but it's education from a different perspective, uh, you know, to people and you know, to 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 uh, teach people about art. Uh, and so, in this town hall, you know, you know, there's a particular focus on integration and equity in the schools. You know, my opinion. You know, I think true integration and equity uh, encompasses educating students on subjects other than, you know, European history. You know, as as uh, Mrs. Weinberg mentioned, also you know the basis of Black history. We need to teach people, you know, other than the basis of Black history, like MLK Day, Rosa Parks, and things like that, because that's you know you know people think that okay, that's Black history. Let's teach people about that. No, there's more to it than just teaching people about that. You know, I guess my question is, how do we how do we start educating students on implicit bias? You know, educating students on the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, over policing in the Black communities, things like that. You know, and the issues in the criminal justice system. 
um, as it relates to people of color. I, you know, I think these are, you know, things that we need to be educating our students on, even at a young age. I mean, these are these uncomfortable, real conversations um, that schools um, need to have because this is this is, you know, could be part of the solution to the problem. Mark, let me hit you with something on that, if I can. Uh, wonderful question. We used to get that around the dinner table at home. You know, that 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 was where we got that education from in the past. But as you said, this education also needs to be done within the system. And that's part of changing the curriculum that is being handed out to these schools and, and, and holding them to task to make sure that's being taught in school systems. Uh, that's a fight we're gonna have to have and that's a fight worth having. Uh, but let me hit you with this right here as far as the arts and talk about Mrs. Smith right quick. The reason I love Shakespeare today is because my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Dorothy Smith, took me out to the Oslo to see As You Like It. Those type of teachers make those differences for our children. So just to uh, touch that a little bit. Yes, and Mr. Smith, your question about how we're gonna do it, we have to start with the staff, the teachers. We have to retrain them. They're the ones walking in our classrooms. They're the ones with the, they're the ones um, sending out the implicit and even in many cases that I've witnessed, explicit. We have to start over. Oh. Good. We, we have we, we have a serious problem. We we have a serious problem, and and the problem you know and, and I can speak more to the state of Florida, even though I've read about other states, but the state of Florida has never relinquished the ability to educate all of the black and brown kids of this state. They've always held control. Matter of fact, if we talk about uh, equity in education we probably was developing greater geniuses when we were segregated than we are now because we are our kids are getting crushed they are getting crushed by the system and looking when we look around you know 165 cases to suppress the vote in america you know that, that in, in the vote so just imagine what they're doing to little kids minds right yeah yeah really good point it just, it reminds me when I was in school in Detroit, uh, the, the school I went to, most of my teachers could relate to me because most of my teachers were black. Uh, I had black men and black women as teachers. And I remember them fondly mm -hmm. today. I mean, going all the way back to third grade, uh, that it makes a big impact and when students are taken out of that setting and forced into something else. And then there's that Eurocentric education system going on. It can really have a deleterious effect all the way around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All and right, we, we have, have a follow-up question from Caitlin Foss. Hi, um, I, I actually also work for the Ringling <laughs> Museum. Um, uh, I'm actually from Sarasota, born and raised and graduated from Booker in 2002. And uh, there was mention earlier of, you know, bias training for newer teachers coming in, but I'm just curious, my own personal experience, um, seeing how different teachers taught based on their predispositions and other considerations. And what about those seasoned teachers, the ones that have been around a long time? I mean, is that something that is being considered too? Is it that we're expecting, you know, with, you know, whatever, whatever we're able to get done, I guess, with regards to the Florida education system. Um, and I say that because uh, obviously, you know, for, for me, uh, I, I went through all of my education in Florida, in Sarasota specifically, and it took me graduating college out of state and coming back and asking some questions about my local community to, to actually learn about segregation in Sarasota and uh, literally any of this information, I, I had to you know, find myself as an adult person and there does not, it wasn't being taught at all. And that was in 2002. So I'm just curious, there was the mention of, of newer teachers, but you know, for, for the ones that have been serving in these roles a long time and maybe um, potentially you know, in a, one particular headspace about how things should be done. Yes, uh, the conversation 
you know, every, every conversation has to have a starting point. And the starting point was with the new teachers, but we would love to help every teacher that we can help with this type of program. So uh, we're going to be pushing the school board to allow us to do as much as possible. Yeah, there is a new um, committee. I don't know how they're calling it. Uh, that is starting to actually, I think I think it's a, uh, equity in it. I don't know how they're calling it. This, yeah, the new superintendent set up. Yeah, the new superintendent setting it up. So that's the good news. The other, we have to watch and see who is going to really embrace it, right? As a teacher, you know, it's tricky if you've been in the system for a long time. Right. Yeah, you got the union to deal with. You yeah. have all these different people and, and entities that's involved in making something like this happen. Uh, let's just face it. You got some teachers that don't want to have nothing to do with this. Right. You know, I, I can remember when we integrated schools, we had teachers that didn't want to teach us and wouldn't. It was like you was in the classroom and wasn't there. You know, I had to go ask a teacher for my test one time, you know, I just walked around and handed everybody a test and I'm sitting there, where's mine? So, uh, you know, the beat goes on though, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I was in a, a school last year with the Lean On Me project and it was a drop-in mentoring program and it served 135 students of all colors, backgrounds and academic levels. And our room was right adjacent to the ISS, uh, ISS or the in-school suspension room. And when a black girl or black uh, boy got mouthy, they were reprimanded in this very raised punitive voice. But when a white girl or white boy got mouthy, the response was, you must be having a bad day. And we were like, what is going on? And this was a younger teacher. So it, it is pervasive. We have created this storyline uh, about uh, someone with a different color skin than, than lighter than white, you know, as a white skin. And it's, it's, just, it's just so bizarre to me that that story continues, that that's the narrative right this second. Yeah. And uh, thank you, everybody. We have a uh, follow up question, and I think it's a timely uh, uh, question. This question is by Ryan Kelly. Ryan Kelly is a teacher at Booker High School, and uh, what everybody sees on the camera feed right now is the Booker Law Academy who is watching this discussion. Mr. Kelly, what's your question? Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Carter Camfield. I'm a third year student uh, with the Booker High School Law Academy, and it's a pleasure to be able to participate in such an important topic. It's something that impacts all of us and our community. Um, my question was in reference to the uh, desegregation of Sarasota County, and I was asking if you could elaborate on the impact of this event in reference to the rest of the United States, as well as was there media coverage nationally displayed? Hello there, Carter. This is uh, Mr. Atkins. I've, def I've met you a few times over the years. And uh, my experience in desegregation in Sarasota County, first off, you have to understand that we didn't get officially desegregated until 1971. You know, just imagine how long it took Sarasota County to do the right thing. And so with that, all of the restraints and the restrictions and the schism that goes along with that happened to us uh, and my family uh, because uh, it was just not something that was welcome. Desegregation was all they had planned to do at the hardest and most difficult time and integration was never part of the plan and it hasn't happened yet. Excellent. Uh, is there another question? I, I can I can hear the wheels turning. <laughs> this is, um, Kirsten Russell. Well, well, let me let me let me I can I can, let me tell you something. Um, and what I've I've experienced in Sarasota, and I, you know, as a young man, you know, Carter's age, I had this vision of what America was going to look like right now, and it and it is it is coming to fruition. But I what I expected was. The, the, the younger generation that was coming through with me, we was gonna change America. 
But what happened to the uh, hippies and the progressive people of the 60s and 50s and 70s? They became just like their parents. And they took on these institutions and started running them just like their parents. And I've got hope for this younger generation right now that they will step into this gap and make this place fairer for everybody. That's that third wave I was talking about for you. Oh, sure. Exactly. All right. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, my name is Kirsten Russell, and I have a question from the point of view of a parent. So I'm a parent of a high school freshman. And one of the things that's really surprised me, if I look back to my education in public schools, we always discussed current events. And I think this builds on the last statement. You know, we're in a time where current events matter. It don't, doesn't matter where you stand on them. These discussions really need to be had. Our students, our youth, need to understand how to have civilized discussions, how yeah. to be able to share their point of view. And I'm really astounded that she's in a very, in a good public high school with amazing teachers and not once has anyone had a current event conversation, not in history. And her biology teacher actually asked the students one day, are you guys talking about these issues? Are you talking about the election? No, they're not. Yes. And I would like to understand if anyone on the call can, is it that it's too, um, too intense that we can't even have these conversations with students? I would just, I'd love anyone's perspective because I think it is really gonna put us in a position where our youth are gonna have a really hard time um, stepping out on their own and developing their own beliefs and, and being able to really process all of those details. Yes, um, hi Kirsten. So as a, uh, I'm a graduate of Emory University and Georgia State University, teacher education, social studies seven through 12. And there was never one course that we ever had on how to teach current events. Luckily, I was savvy enough to be able to teach current events and cared and had the passion to be relevant to my students. And my first teaching experience was an all black school. And we, we worked it, we talked it, we danced it out. And unless you are trained in how to have civil discourse and how to listen uh, non-judgmentally, the teachers aren't going to do it because their feet are held to the fire to get through certain standards. And the standards are archaic. They don't match what's coming or what's even here. You know, I had a, 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 a rule at, at my home when my girls were growing up that, you know, six o'clock come in the house, we look at the news. That's right. And we sat there and we did that as a family. They hated it, of course, you know. <laughs> we don't know how many times we had fights about that. But my middle daughter, she was a student at Florida A&M. She called me one evening. She goes, thank you, Dad. I said, for what? What, you got to check or something? She said, no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, Dad, because I aced my current event course because you trained me to look at the news and that still do that. So I could do that and pass that test easily. So what it comes down to is we've got to get that type of class, if you want to call it or something, part of the curriculum is in schools. And also you as a parent, as you said you were, it's got to do those type of things. You know, uh, some of this stuff is parent responsibility. I did. Um, in response to what was said earlier about the curriculum, hi, I'm a 30 law student. My name is Sophia Santiago. Um, in the during the time of the election basically everywhere i was it was mostly talked about in school i think it's mostly depending on the uh atmosphere you're in like in the law academy it was a big impact on all of us even the news came in and wrote an editorial on it about us learning through it as well but in response of current events that's basically what most of um 
our ACE, like English level classes are based off, like we take little perspectives in order to achieve our diploma. And that's basically the whole curriculum. We're told to do an essay and a PowerPoint, uh, and we're told to work on it for months. And it's basically about current global issues, local issues, or Good. national issues, issues. So it's mostly built into our curriculum as we progress through the years of high school. And a lot of people do become passionate at the end. Like most of us, we're really passionate about politics and like learning more about it. And like Mr. Kelly helps us with that as well, without biases opinions. But it's mostly depending on um, what program you're in, what school you're in, and the atmosphere you're in as well. And your open like mindedness as well. Because during the election, I walked into like, during the inauguration, like four of my classes were playing it, live, live stream. So, so it comes down to good teachers. Yeah, it's mostly because our school is probably one of the best in the area, but. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we get something like that to be integrated through all the schools within their county? That's the challenge. That's the challenge. Yeah, it's most, I think a lot of what comes in play is the diversity we have here. Whereas in Sarasota and Riverview, you don't see as much diversity. Kids coming from different like classes or like different um, races as well. See here we're one third everything, but the demographics are different in every other school. So that's kind of an impact on it as well. A very good point. Yeah. Very good observation. Hi, Ms. Lady. Pearson, we do have another question from Ms. Jill lewis Spector. She's yeah. right it now. My name is Jill and I am new to Sarasota. I uh, just moved here in November and I've already taken on the responsibility of chairing the education committee for the League of Women Voters of Sarasota County. Good for you. But uh, I have a, encountered a few shockers. First of all, you know, <laughs> really? <laughs> New Jersey is actually um, has the most segregated schools of the entire country. And it's attributed to affordable housing and how the communities are set up and where the schools are located in the state. But Florida has something very different. Florida has vouchers, which um, send school kids to all kinds of schools. Um, and I understand there's a new bill, HB 48, that may pass. And I'm curious about that bill and how you see that affecting the goals that you have for Sarasota schools in terms of cultural proficient teaching and segregation in the schools. Yes, so um, I'm part of Leadership Florida class six right now, and that is a big conversation in that 46 uh, group person, person um, group. And we have had Commissioner Corcoran speak to us and other, you know, executive branch people under the Department of Education. And I, I wish I could just tell you that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you that it's not going to be okay because it's noise again. It's just noise again. Now, there is something called the McKay Scholarship, which is a little bit different. But that McKay scholarship was for people with you know, disabilities. And if you found a school could do better, a better job, then you might take them out and use that dollar for that. This is not that anymore. So we are, we're creating even more of a segregated entitlement situation. <laughs> and um, I, I, I wish as an educator, I could say, I can hold up my protest time and say, hey guys, stop. Can we re-look at this? But because I'm not the leader in the executive branch, it, the, the, it's still Eurocentric. So until we change our mindset from the current system, we will keep walking down this road. So I, um, you know, I. I, I keep reiterating and remembering what I know about Florida and its education system. Mm -hmm. And it has been lacking in every juncture of progress throughout the history of education in the state of Florida. That's why we, we sit here in Florida and we wonder why we can't get big tech companies, why we can't get big progressive companies 
to come to Florida, it's because we don't have students that's prepared to be employees for those companies. And Florida knows that. And they keep masquerading this truth about they are preparing for the future, when in reality, they are preparing for the few and the special that want to continue to perpetuate this ignorance. That's correct. I have to tell you that at my, oh, you want me to stop, uh, Mr. Pearson? Well, we, we're running low on time, so I'd like to introduce uh, Jay Castle uh, with, with a question, and this will probably be the last question we're able to introduce from the audience for the day. Th thanks, everybody, for doing this today. This has been really great. Um, you guys talked about curriculum, and um, I'm not really smart about how curriculum is developed in the state or how it passes. So, I mean, Amy, can you give us a little bit of an insight of what goes into curriculum development? And, and really more importantly, what role does money and influence and political influence play in curriculum rolling out in the state? Money and influence in the curriculum, from my perspective as an educator, it rolls the same way it does in politics. And how is curriculum developed? Um, usually by a panel of people who are not necessarily in the classroom. So um, it, that's a problem. So calls that I've been on um, with other educators, um, when they, when, like I said, feet are stuck to the fire regarding standards, their kids are quivering and they're still, and we're not addressing their emotional needs to learn. So what we have done is put up barriers and created fear in our curriculum so that those students who want to succeed are always in fear of succeeding. So we're lowering the bar for the, you know, for the many and raising it for the few, like my colleague, Mr. Atkins said, and it is constant. It is us, the white people who are in the executive branch of the Department of Education, who are in the local Sarasota school board, who are teachers, we haven't changed our mindset. And that's how curriculum will change. And we have to be courageous to step up to the plate. <laughs> you're on mute. Pearson, you're on mute. Pearson, take your... I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was just saying, what can our audience members do then to help bring about that change? They're starting a book. I think they just did. <laughs> I, I, just, just by being an audience to yeah. a conversation like this, so that they can have a different perspective on what is really going on out there. Because I know a lot of people in this audience has never heard me speak on this process, but they never thought about it being any different than in what it really is. So I encourage them to continue this conversation within their own little satellite groups and in their families and with their children and grandchildren because that's what's going to make the difference in this country. These are two dialogues. Yes. I'd, like to, I'd like to, at this time, thank you so much to our panelists, our moderator, and our viewers. We will not just wait for February to discuss Black history. Please keep the conversation going all year long. Black history is an American history. We will post a link to this video to the Sarasota County Bar Association Facebook page, and we will have it available for viewing on the Sarasota County Bar Association YouTube uh, channel. We welcome your comments and continue dialogue. And don't forget to like and share it with your families and colleagues. If we have piqued your interest, please consider becoming an active member of the Council for Diversity and Inclusion. We welcome new members and new perspectives. I also was remiss in not mentioning the collaboration with the Manatee County Diversity and Inclusion Committee earlier in my announcement, but I'd like to thank them as well as thank again, the Community Foundation of Sarasota for sponsoring today's presentation. And thank you for joining us today. God bless.